All right, today on the Win Daily Show, I have the incredible, the legend, Brandon Steiner, entrepreneur, author, speaker, founder and president of the Steiner Agency and Collectible Exchange, formerly of Steiner Sports. As I said, professional speaker and author of the business playbook, You Gotta Have Balls and Living on Purpose. How are you doing today, Brandon? I'm doing well, thank you. And, uh, you know, just trying to stay, stay safe stay healthy and uh, prayers for all the healthcare workers and everybody that is not quite in the complete safe mode. I'm hoping that, you know, tomorrow is going to be a better day for everybody. That's what we're hoping every day. Every day we hope is better. Uh, that's all we can do. And yes, we appreciate your, your thoughts and your prayers. As you said, I have some friends that anytime I see them or I hear about them, every, every few days I send them a message and say, hey, hope you're doing well. Thank you for doing what you do. So Brandon, I have to, the first question I have for everybody on this show is how do you go about every day making sure that you're winning daily? Well, I was just thinking the other day how, you know, is there anything more fun than winning? I don't think it has to be. I don't think winning has to be everything as Vince Lombardi said, but I love winning. You know, I think winning's fun. So, you know, to me, I think, God, I hate to sound like an old person when I say this, but I, I think a lot of it is mental mindset. Um, for me, it isn't about where I'm at and whether I'm winning or losing. It's about my level of acceptance. Um, and that's what that's the difference. And, and it enables me to get in the win columns at some point by the end of the day because I'm not willing to accept losing. I'm not willing to accept a, a not a productive day. I'm not willing to accept, in general, wherever I'm at. And this has been going on for about 55 years now. Like, I'm just not willing to accept. I mean, it's not that I'm not unhappy and I'm not greedy or this or that. I just think that. Once you're willing to accept where you're at, you're probably in for a downward slope. So my mental mindset is always trying to be more focused on whether I'm accepting the circumstances or whether I have the balls to not accept them. And then when I, then again, the next question is going to be is, you know, what are you going to do about it? And, uh, you know, eating healthy and exercising and trying to get the proper amount of sleep and making sure I got, you know, an, enough time for the people that matter to me the most is – is winning. Um, and if you have those things covered, then you have a lot of clarity and you have plenty of time to go grind and go fight the fight that you want, which is really the fun part, you know, making money and, or whatever it is you're doing. But, you know, I think a lot of times people, they, they kind of skip over the, the, some of the fundamental stuff about, you know, trying to put yourself in a position to be productive. Like you need energy. So you need to eat right. You need energy. You need to sleep right. You know, you need to work out. You need to keep yourself healthy particularly in times like this, I mean, you're probably more glad that you're healthy because, you know, this virus does take advantage of people that are not healthy. So if no other lesson you learn from this virus, it's, it's, you know, Hey, it's important to stay healthy because your body can then go fight against some, you know, odd things that happen. And that's how I feel in business, like by staying healthy and keep my body and keep my mind kind of straight, I'm able to go out into that world and fight the fight because, you know, making money and winning in business is hard. You know, it's tough. I mean, and it is a, it is a, it is an enemy a lot of times. And it is, it is, you know, there's a lot of things out there you don't see, but uh, you know, you got to put yourself in the best position with your fundamental stuff. And that's, I, I, that's, I talk a lot about that in my last book um, is, you know, putting yourself, you know, by using purpose, you know, which is a lot of stuff. You get the purpose by having a high level of non-acceptance. That's really what leads to a purpose. Like, if you're not willing to take this shit anymore, I'm not willing to, well, that's going to lead you to making a damn commitment to not tolerating it. And then you start figuring out what you got to do to get out and move on to the next phase. I love that, man. That is awesome. And I feel like this is, we're going to have some fun for the next few minutes. This is going to be an absolute blast, Brandon. Thank you so much. And, and just to follow up on that, you know, as you said, you've been doing this thing for 55 years. That mindset doesn't come day one, right? It takes a little while to really develop that and learn that. And I'm sure you've had some inklings there from the beginning. Uh, but you and I are both, uh, you know, good friends with David Meltzer. He's a very good friend of mine. I see uh, you share his stuff all the time as well. And yeah. understanding how, you know, he always preaches the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential, right? So how long did it really take you to develop this mindset to make sure that on a daily basis, you are able to consistently and persistently pursue that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit of an odd, I'm, I'm more of an odd story. And I don't, I don't think that, you know, that it, it, I don't know if it really matters. It just matters that you're getting like what, 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 what he was saying, uh, what Meltzer was saying, it's being the pursuit of it. Like, I felt like I had that as, as a, probably a 10, 11 year old, nine year old, you know, like 
I was already like, I, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, man. I mean, I'm out for the hustle. Now, what I would say is a lot of times what brings you to your non-acceptance work could bring you to a high level of commitment is you're back against the wall. Like you have no other choice. Um, I don't highly recommend that a 10 year old should have his back against the wall and better go out there and figure out how to make some money, go figure it out because you know, otherwise you're not going to have food or you may not have clothes. I, I don't know if that's necessary. I don't, I didn't need to have that happen for my kids for them to find purpose and commitment and they've lived a really good childhood, unlike maybe necessarily the comforts I had with, or the lack of comforts that I had. But I mean, I feel like I, I feel like since I can remember, I was like going out into the streets looking for opportunity. Fortunately, I did it, you know, in a, in a somewhat. My my mom was a big influence on me, and her favorite line was "You got to have balls." So she was always guiding me and showing me a lot of different opportunities that usually you wouldn't have a conversation with a nine, 10, 11 year old about. And it wasn't necessarily on a lot of those opportunities I could do much about, but I got the gist, you know, I was like, you know, if you grind and hustle and put two plus two together, you can get five. And if you meet the right people and you take inventory of the right people, which is you can't put a price tag on meeting enough people. And I think that doesn't necessarily mean just likes or, people that are linked in with you but you know if you have relationships with enough people you can't go out and do that you'd be surprised where that can take you over time and I feel like I've been doing that for a long long time and because my kids are like dad you know so many people like you seem like you know somebody everywhere I'm like listen why would you go anywhere and not get to know somebody and develop a relationship and see how you can provide some value you know because you know people if you can provide value for people you have relationships with they're not going to throw away your number it's a great right? point. Absolutely. I, value is, by the way, is something you can do for someone that they can't do for themselves. So anytime you get in any kind of relationship, business, personal, you should always be thinking about, you know, what can I do for this person to help them? And it, sometimes it doesn't take much. It's not, it's not a pretentious way. It's like, hey, I want to have a meaningful relationship. How can I help you? You know, what can I do? And, and it's actually more selfless than anything because I don't know if, the, if anybody's ever going to do anything back. So, but it's, it's, it's a grown up game to play. I, I think as a kid, a lot of my friends never really understood it. So in, in all my process, you know, so what if I help my, one of my neighbors go pick up groceries or so what if I, but you know, meanwhile, those are the people that maybe help me get into college or help me be surprised how it just all kind of comes around. And sometimes it doesn't, but it's a good feeling. I think helping people is not a burden anyway. It's really a, Matter of fact, help, helping people actually is an opportunity that leads you to share joy. So, I mean, it's probably the best thing you're going to do in your life or the most enjoyment you're going to have in your life outside of your own personal family and, and a few other things. But I don't know, man. You, you help somebody in a, in a complete unconditional way. It's a good feeling. It's nice. And especially, you know, you did it just because you just wanted to do it. I think that's really the richest thing you could do. I completely agree. I, I try to help others. I uh, got the knack for it. I know you worked in a couple of restaurants growing up. I worked in, uh, I pretty much grew up in restaurants. And that was one thing where it really got me to understanding exactly how, what unconditionally is and how it works and just helping people because it's the right thing to do. I'm very big in karma. My mom always preached that when I was growing up. So I always try and be just good to everybody else. Because as you said, you get enjoyment out of that. I, I enjoy helping other people, seeing, putting that smile on their face. If I never talk to them again, you know, that's fine. But at the same time, as you said, you never know how those relationships are going to come back around and be able to affect you in your life. And, uh, you know, obviously, again, you know, the creation of Steiner Sports back in 87, you, you rise, rise to success with New York sports, and you got to relate with and spend time with all these athletes. I'm assuming to develop these relationships, as you said, you provided a significant amount of value up front to these athletes to help create those relationships and find ways to do business with them. So if you don't mind telling, I'm sure you got a couple stories in your back pocket, if you don't mind telling. I mean, us it's everything, you know, when I, when I go and teach sales seminars, one of the things I talk about is, you know, for, focus on the solution, not the sale. And it's so important to serve and solve. The sale comes, you know, when you're serving and solving the sale comes and, so I would, you know, when you meet most athletes and celebrities, you know, most people are so starstruck, which, you know, I am still to this day. I mean, you know, you meet a great, somebody who's great and maybe the best would ever did. Of course, you can be a little starstruck, but what goes in my mind immediately is how can I help this person? Like, what could I do for this? And I would always come up with a whole slew of ideas that I always felt that athletes could use help with. There's always white space, no matter what, there's always white space with everyone. Everybody needs help. 
regardless how famous rich you are, everybody needs help. Now, some people don't like to admit it, and there have been a lot of stubborn athletes over the years, but everyone needs help. You know, when I got an opportunity to work with Derek Jeter in the 90s, you know, he was putting his foundation together, and that's where my focus was, not I wonder if I could make money. I, I thought, you know, it'd be really good to be able to do some marketing with him. But in the mid-90s, he was a young kid, but I figured, you know, let me take a chance. You know, Mariana was hard, having a hard time speaking English and kind of getting around. So, you know, I helped him with a lot of little things, with travel, car services. I didn't know he was going to end up being Mariano or there. I mean, I look like a genius now, but, you know, having worked with him for the last 25 years, but I'm like, I didn't know. But, you know, you, you get a good feeling about a person, and that's very important. You know, I, I try to work with people that I like that are good people. I'm not, um, I'm not horse trading with them. And, you know, you make an investment in, in a relationship, and I think um, it's tough for some people to give without the get. And I think that for me, I remember working with Yogi Berra. I was just talking about this the other day, but I killed myself for yoga. I did so many things back in the early 90s. I was just getting started, and, and it's Yogi Berra. Now, it was, you know, working with him was like a blessing. He was amazing. And one day I got a call from his sons. He said, we're taking over all his marketing, and if you want anything, call us. I was devastated, really bummed. But I had done everything with this guy I possibly could. And I couldn't believe that I was now going to be someone on the outside. But then, you know, two years later, Phil Rizzuto out of nowhere gets his call for the Hall of Fame from the Veterans Committee. And everybody's trying to get Phil to sign up with them for marketing. And he's, you know, one of, you know, I hadn't been a Hall of Fame of the Yankees in a while then. It was 94. The Yankees weren't that good at that point. It was a big deal. And I was competing against a lot of big companies and people have been there a while. And I was sitting in the living room. I'm trying to pitch him and Cora his wife. And I'm like, man, I got to get this. I don't know how I'm going to get this. And then like two days later, Phil calls and says, you know, Steiner, it was called me Steiner. Yes. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to sign with you. I still have that contract, by the way, the first one he signed for me. And about, you know, sometime later, you know, he had said, listen, the reason why I went with you is because I was talking to Yogi and you probably don't know the Yogi and I are very good friends. And Yogi said that even all the stuff that you had done for him, if I was going to do a marketing thing with somebody, that, you should, that I should do a deal with you because nobody's going to work harder for me than you. So even though it didn't end exactly the way I wanted to with Yogi, and it's funny, years back, I ended up getting back with Yogi and his kids and ended up doing all this stuff for the last five, six years when he was alive. So that was a blessing too. But, you know, you never know where the good and, and you just got to focus on doing good quality work and getting better every day and trying to do more and as much as you can for as many people. And I think, you know, it's like, I didn't really know what I was into. I was just trying to book Yogi so I could pay my rent, you know what I mean? Like, but I was always trying to hustle, come up with really good ideas. And then here he is giving Phil Rizzuto a testimonial to help me, which I didn't even know. And then Phil ends up signing with me as opposed to like 30 other people that's trying to get him. That was a big break in my career, man. So you don't know where the breaks and transition is going to come in. What you do know is you put as much good out there as you can. I love that. That's an awesome story, man. Thank you for telling that one. That's, I mean, it's so important. It's just like, you know, it's playing the long game, right? Like we all, we all want the instant gratification, especially now, you know, we talk about the millennials and Gen Z and, you know, how we want everything as, as quickly as we can, but it's understanding that there is a long game to this. And as you yeah. said before, you don't know where that's going to come from. It may come in the form of, you know, just helping out Mariano Rivera because he needs help and you're a good person love, or it might come in the form I, of way, Yogi Berra I, 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 giving you a testimonial. I love, I love the Gen Z. I love the, the kids in Gen Z right now. You know, I was a little, I was a little troubled with some of the millennials. I, I was having a hard time getting my arms around it. They're a very, very smart group of kids too, or now the young adults, I should say, but thank you. I love the Gen Z kids. The Gen Z kids now, the kids that I'm seeing from 15 to 20, 15 to 22 are, there is no boundaries with, with this group. They're definitely not willing to settle, as I was saying earlier. They're not interested in getting all fascinated because there's some, some tech and some, some new apps and some things. They, they want to take that make it easier, make it better. There's a real, there's a real fight in, in, in I'm finding that. And I'm seeing a really large level of entrepreneurism right now with teenagers, kids that want to make money, that want to make things better, that I see just incredible levels of entrepreneurism. And maybe part of it is just society accepting entrepreneurism a lot more. Uh, you know, I was growing up, I was an odd kid. They didn't know what to do with me. You know, I was like, you know, if it wasn't, if it wasn't bolted down, I was selling it, hustling on it. And I was considered just a really strange, odd kid. And school didn't help. You know, they weren't teaching any of that kind of stuff. So I, I really learned most of that on the streets. But I really like what I see now with 
you know, even though there's a 40 year, you know, I'm 60 now, I have a bunch of kids that I, um, that I'm friendly with that are, you know, 18, 19, 20 that mentor me. And I mentor them like we were reverse mentoring. I've learned so much from them and it's amazing what they know and what, what they've shown me. And then, you know, I, I hopefully I've been able to add value back. Like I, I love what I'm seeing now. Uh, I'm not sure what, what, what clicked. So, but I'm excited about youth today and the, the fight. And, and also like we got caught up in the nine of five thing with the millennials and, you know, a lot of stuff maybe was given to them very quickly because it was a very tight job market when a lot of them were coming out of school. But I see with the Generation Z, like, they have no boundaries. Like, 11 o'clock at night, I'll come over. Like, so you're going to drive the scars? Yeah, well, why not? But, you know, it's 1 in the morning, I'm getting text. You know, 11 at night, I'm getting calls. And I, I love that shit. I love, I'm like, you're going to go. Let's go. You know what I mean? What, what, what are we going to do? We're going to get, oh, well, I'll call you tomorrow. Like, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have personal time and boundaries, but I'm like, when you're on a roll, especially I always, my mother was a big gambler and I spent a lot of time in casinos and my mother bet on everything. And she's like, listen, when you're hot, it's not the time to leave the casino. And I feel that way in business. Like when you're hot and you got some stuff going, there's no better time to go and get more. And a lot of times people get satisfied because they've had some winnings. That's the time to get, get into the deeper end of the pool, I think. But that's, that's me. Who leaves on a heater, right? Nobody leaves on a heater. That's ridiculous. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. And man. I'm, loving, is... I'm loving. I'm By the way, I'm loving what gambling now. I, I, it was. I've been watching a lot of sports stuff, but I love what gambling now is. Is at first I was a little down on the fact that you know you can bet on all these sports anywhere and everywhere. So I always like going to Vegas and I with my son and we go bet on a bunch of games. Now you can almost do it anywhere. But I think it's going to add a tremendous amount of excitement to these games that sometimes get a little monotonous and now all of a sudden I'm, I'm betting on you know how many runs in the first inning I'm betting on how many strikeouts this guy's gonna have how many touchdowns I think it just makes the whole game so much more exciting and when I think it's a little troublesome with older people to get them to really understand how it works I think the younger generations have got it so somehow we got to get older people to know this is just as good as a card game it's just as good as blackjack. You know, you, you could play one inning, you could play one at bat, and it makes the games incredibly fun. And so you're not really worried if the game's a little long or not. So I'm, I've become a much bigger fan about the whole gambling and sports now because I think it just adds so much more excitement to watching a game or going to a game. I'm just hoping that the players can keep the track from it. And, and you're obviously always nervous, players in financial trouble, that kind of thing. But I think if that stands tall, and history doesn't repeat itself because we have had that problem in the past. You, you just increase the level of excitement in sports probably tenfold. Right. Like fan is short for fanatics. So no matter what, you're going to love what your team does. or You're going to hate what your team does. Now, now put 20 bucks on it. Now, now put 20, now, you know, like put, put the money on it, put a hundred, put whatever much you're betting, you're gambling and really get it to the point where again, you know, you have that sweat. You have, you have that little extra excitement involved. And I mean, who doesn't love even more excitement in sports already? And then you have the opposite side, which is, you know, I tell the story. I went to Rutgers. I have a buddy of mine who went to Ohio State. And we had a bet on if Rutgers could cover. And it was like 43 and a half points. It was some ridiculous number. And, and they, ended up, they ended up covering those. So like there's three or four minutes left in the fourth quarter. The stadium's empty. Nobody's even there anymore. And we're sitting on the edge of the couch just hoping Rutgers scores this touchdown to cover the spread. And I mean, it just makes it, Every aspect of the game now, as you said, you can bet and at bat yeah. on, you know, player props, all this stuff. I think it's just going to make, as you said, everything so much more exciting. Sports gambling should be just called the game within the game. That's, that, that's my tagline for sports gambling, the game I within the that. game. And, and that's, what it, that's really what it is. And it's, you're right. You're rooting on a game, a 20-point spread, and, and you're rooting for the over or it's just some outlandish thing, and, and you don't have to feel like a degenerate about it. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm staying on the fourth quarter to see if they cover. Yep. Maybe <laughs> maybe one more beer, too. You never know. You got to have a good – good. so – I, I love this. You're just, uh, you're an absolute blast to get to listen to. And, and I know you've been a professional speaker for a while now, since the early two thousands, obviously you've written a few books. Where, where did that side come from? Like, obviously you've always wanted to give value. So where yeah. did the idea to get up on stage and start talking to people? I saw you had a Ted talk as well. You know, you're writing all yeah. these books. Where did all that come from? Well, I mean, I started speaking as a kid. My mother was a public speaker back when women weren't speaking. And you know, my mother was just a complete lunatic when it came to not following the rules. You know, back in, we're talking in the 50s and 60s, she's 
was doing some uh, po political speaking on a soapbox, that kind of stuff. She was just a pretty different kind of woman. So she taught me how to public speak in her early age. And I was never the best student. I made the top 90% of my class possible. You know, I mean, I'm, I really struggled in college, but I believed in school and I hung in there, but it wasn't, it wasn't easy for me. But I always did well in public speaking because my mother would always um, teach me how to public speak and taught me how to organize a speech and, and taught me how to, you know, be a little creative, how to be a little funny. So that's where that comes in. I think the first book, The Business Playbook, which is the first book I came out with back in 2004, when I got out of college, it's, I went to Syracuse, and that was probably the biggest break maybe I've ever, ever gotten. Um, I couldn't get a job, and I wanted to go work in the hotel restaurant business, and that's what I had been doing my whole childhood, and cooking and working in restaurants and hotels and wherever I could get a, a job. And I said, you know, this is just too hard. When I figure this shit out, I'm going to write a book. Imagine I couldn't get a job. I'm already making a commitment to writing a book about it because I figured I'm going to figure it out. You know, I'm not going to accept this. And I'm going to figure this out. And when I do figure it out, I want to share it with a lot of kids. So my first book, The Business Playbook, is really just about how do you get started as a high school or a college kid and how do you start building your brand and planning. Because what happens is a kid, you spend so much energy trying to figure out how to graduate high school, get through high school, go to college. Think about how much planning with school and this and that and the testing. But you don't really put the same kind of energy in what you're going to do when you get out. You may go on a couple of interviews, maybe you put a resume together, but you're not completely consumed about what you can do when you get out of school and how you're going to handle the interviews and what kind of potential jobs are really out there, the same way you're looking at the potential colleges. And that's what that first book was about. And I, and, and I probably went to about 60 colleges from Hawaii to Vegas to Minnesota. I mean, I went everywhere, you know, Harvard. And I really enjoyed it. And I really made my focus on 100%. I made my focus on colleges and high schools and then the second book what was happening is we we're having a lot of success at steiner and i just felt like this i mean it was and i'm very blessed i don't say this i'm i'm not complaining i'm explaining i'm not complaining but everywhere we went my wife was like you know i can't hang out with you anymore if another person walks up and said how'd you get steiner started how this happened and I, and she's right like we go to a wedding to be like you know four deep at the table like What's going on? How'd you do that? How do you have all those players? Because, you know, back in the mid 2000s, I, I probably had 40, 50 exclusive players. I had so many big names. It was a really crazy little run. And so I just decided to write a book. And that's what you got to have balls is, is about how I got started, which was basically when I was 10 years old and how I built this brand and how I built Steiner. So it's a great inspirational, motivational book. And I just, you know, I just have always enjoyed the speaking. I love the sales workshops and talking to mid-level people because I always feel like there's room to go and grow. And I just, I just feel like I can give people that little edge and insight. And I don't, I don't tell people what to do. That's what I love about my style of speaking. I don't, I've seen a lot of speakers that you got to go out there, you got to grind, throw, you know, send out 2000 emails and you'll get one back. Like I, I, I don't tell people what to do. I show people what I did. And I'm able to story tell very specific stories of sales I've made, of screw ups I've made, of employees that I've hired and how I got them to work for me, employees that I didn't fire or fire properly. And that's, I think, what people really want is they want to be able to learn through your ups and through your downs. And that's my style of speaking. And it's fun. And I, I always, in, in that process, it keeps me growing and going. And I think that's very important, as you said, you know, you, you, you touched upon a couple of things during that, um, you know, obviously you got to have balls. That was what your mom said to you from a young age. So I think that that's great. You named, named the, name the second book after it and, and also not accepting, you know, that first one, you didn't, as you said, you didn't even have a job, but you were not accepting the fact that you would not only have a job, but you wouldn't figure the industry out. So I really like how uh, a lot of this does come full circle from what you've been saying this whole time. I mean, my first job, it was, it was in August, and my mother kept telling me I should go to Europe. And I was like, I wanted no part of that. I wanted to go work. I didn't want to go on a, on a backpack trip to Europe. And I'm sitting in my, uh, you know, my, my mom's apartment. And I wrote a letter that the, the university had sent me a lead that they're, they're looking for somebody. And yeah, I've done, probably sent out 100 of these and got zero. And I said, you know something, screw it. I wrote this uh, cover letter in red flare magic marker. And told the guy, I said, listen, if you don't hire me, you're going to be in the red. And 
these, this is why you should hire me. It's a no brainer. And the guy like called me, he's like, who are you? Like who sends a letter in red flare marker? I said, he goes, this is so odd. I, I said, I, I, he's like, I'm going to give you this interview. I don't know if I'm going to hire you, but I want to meet you. And then I went down to Baltimore and I got that job. So, I mean, you definitely got to differentiate yourself and you got to know when to, you know, listen, there are times to differentiate yourself and there are times when, you know, you just got to kind of play it somewhat straight. You got to know when to pull it out of your hat and, and take a chance. And I've done that a few times with some athletes and had that door hit my ass on the way out. And I've done it a few times where like athlete looks up and I'm like, whoa, and I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to like, you know, get into it with some athletes and tell them the truth. Um, but it does take a while to have that kind of stamina and support to take that chance. I don't recommend being reckless with your, you know, be, having balls. It, you, you always want to be a little fearless and you got to know when to take a chance every now and then. And it doesn't always work out. <laughs> that's true. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it does. And, you know, that's the thing. Like, I think the hardest thing is like when, if you, if you think that a big, like it, this also same with gambling, same thing with sports, like, if losing is a big part of winning, like nobody goes a hundred and oh, I used to go out, I coached little league. I go out to the mound. I go, you know, you weren't, I mean, did you think you were going to pitch a shutout? Now, if you could hold this team to two runs, I know we could score three. It's okay. You made a couple of mistakes. You threw a couple of bad pitches. Don't worry about it. You didn't, you were going to throw all your pitches perfect. And so one of the big problems is that with success, you, you start really climbing up the ladder, you start getting a lot more success, you are going to increase your amount of failure. And that can be troublesome for some. I talked to a lot of other uh, friends that have climbed up the ladder and had some success, and it's getting used to a higher level of failure is the problem, not so much like the fear of failing, be it you're going to fail. And I think that was a, a difficult time for me in the mid-2000s when my my success was getting to uh, the highest level it had at that point and yet i was screwing up i was making mistakes more than i'd ever made before and i think you know when you're out there it it's it's okay to make some mistakes you're going to screw up um and a matter of fact if you're not screwing up you're probably not growing and helping yourself much which when you think about it your, your best learning lessons probably come from the time you've you know you face some adversity you, you've messed up absolutely that's, that's that's what gets your attention but how, how did you overcome that either feeling or, or just the actual failures themselves? Um, I mean, a lot of it, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, success comes from strategy and confidence in yourself in executing your strategy. So you have to go back to your base and say, listen, do I like my strategy? And do I have confidence that I can execute my strategy? And I think when you, when you get down to it, you know, if you can be confident in your strategy, and confidence that you can execute it, you can really get past the failure. So that's really what it comes down to, confidence in yourself and confidence in your strategy. So if you have a shitty strategy, you're not going anywhere anyway. And you got to believe in your strategy. So I think a lot of times people forget that, you know, and part of it, you know, the hard lesson for me was faith too. Like I wanted everything to be black and white. I wanted everything to be clear, you know? And when it came down to it, I realized that, you got to have faith and faith is like believing in something that sometimes you can't even see. So, you know, you got to mix a little faith into the potion. Not everything is clearly outlaid in the strategy into all these decks and numbers, but you know, you have to have some faith also along with confidence in your strategy and your ability to execute it. Um, and I think that's what I learned a little bit later on is that sometimes you got to just, leave it up to the people above and, and, and just for the good spirits that you have, that it's going to work out. Why wouldn't it work out? And if it doesn't, well, then you'll pick up the pieces and reset your strategy again. It's not I the worst it. thing in the world. What's the worst thing in the world that's going to happen? You know, as long as you're breathing, you're healthy and your loved ones are there. I mean, what else is, you know, it, you get kind of got to be careful that you don't get your ego mashed in all this because sometimes that can be very painful. And uh, I love that book, Ego is the Enemy, um, and it, it does take a lot of people down uh, as opposed to realizing that, you know, when you get into these, you know, when you're trying to build stuff, especially at Steiner, where there was no clear path, you know, I was building an industry, putting some methodology behind this, what was a hobby, and, and it's like, you know, I mean, I don't recommend it, because you go into some dark places, a lot of the stuff you're trying to do, nobody sees it. 
even if you know, I come home, like my, my own family's looking at me like, dad, I don't know. Like, you sure? I'm like, Oh God. I mean, so, you know, a lot of times you have to look past it. And I think the entrepreneurship, I always tell people like, if you don't have a high tolerance for risk and at the same time being able to have leadership skills and have some faith, it's not going to be for you. Yeah, entrepreneurship became like the sexy word that a lot of people want to throw around. But then when you get to the big boy table, it's like hitting on 16 in a blackjack game. You know, it's, it's you know, when, when that spread's tight, you know, you're, you're not afraid to squeak in there and get in between that spread because that's what you're doing. You're finding the white space. You're finding the un, untapped ground there. And a lot of times it's, it's narrow. You know, or it's definitely not seen. I mean, I don't think anybody saw this collectible thing becoming a real industry. And it really has been. And I'm very grateful, you know, to have an opportunity to go build something. It's what I always dreamt of. I didn't know it was going to be sports. But as a kid, I I had no interest in just being successful and just finding a business and making a lot of money. Like, that just had no interest to me. I wanted to do something that was unique, different, unusual, had some wow factor to it, and had some fun. And, and. I wasn't thinking like I wasn't thinking about the money. I wasn't thinking I ever could make a lot of money even uh, until I actually made it. <laughs> Isn't that funny how it works? I mean, it's hard to imagine, but if you're if you're doing something and and your end game is to make a lot of money, you're you're probably you may make a lot of money, but you're definitely not going to have any fun, or you're probably not going to probably make a lot of money, or be that happy, right? Happiness yeah. is is key in a lot of this uh, because I live in a make- neighborhood full of you know people have a ton of money who more misery in this neighborhood and you know so making a lot of money doesn't you know buy you anything other than a really good hotel room and maybe a, a nice car and a little bit of a bigger house and when it comes down to it I spend most of my time in the kitchen and in the tv room like everybody else so it's all overrated but i completely um, agree but you know it's hard i, I try to I, I tell people all the time like if you if you do get a lot of money you don't have to regret it and you want to waste it on certain things it's fine the money grab is cool I'm not i'm not against the money grab like if you want to have three ferraris or a beach house whatever it is that's cool but not at the expense of being a shitty dad or a you know basically a missing husband or not a good brother or that kind of thing it's not worth it I completely agree. And I do, um, you know, again, this is, this is absolutely fantastic, Brandon. And you're, you're, you're dropping that's the so living much on knowledge. Purpose book, by the way, say it again, that, that what we just talked about, that's the living on purpose book is the balance. It, there's no such thing as life balance, but it's, it's, it's life work balance, but it's, it's work and respect life. I love that's that. The, that's, that's, that's what the book should have been called because I'm not going to sit here and tell you like, you know, go home and, Listen, you're on a roll, you love and work, but if you all of a sudden you haven't been home in three years, obviously, <laughs> what are you going to do with all that money? Because the closet will be empty when you get home. But, and living on purpose is just about showing you how you can do both and kill it at work if you want. You can go do the money grab and have all the things you want that you think you want and still be healthy, have, be a good dad, be a good husband, but you got to pay attention and respect it. I was just going to say, it has a lot to do with the the time that you are there, right? And it has to do with how engaged you are. If you're at home, you know, in those, you know, however many years you're on the road half the time and the other half the time you're at home, but you're still working, you're on your laptop, you're answering emails, you're on phone calls. How at home really are you at that point? But I always told my employees, I see, I, I guess back to the acceptance, I always tell my employees, unless somebody's giving me a boatload of money, I'm not getting on the plane. But Brandon, yeah, it's not, not getting on the plane. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going away for three days and hoping we get, to, like, you know, I pick my spots. So you have to be able to walk away from some of it too. But you're right. Part of it is the quality you spend and, and that's important. And it's hard when you're in the grind and you're trying to figure stuff out. It's not easy to, to you know, to departmentalize. But a lot of times you just have to say no. Like, no, I'm not doing that. And uh, it does sometimes take a little bit away from your career path. It may jeopardize it. But when you do great quality work, you be people aren't so quick to throw you out in the street because you don't want to do a couple road trips. I love that. That's good stuff, man. And, and you touched upon the, um, the collectible business a little bit. Um, and I just wanted to read a, a line that I thought was really great. So collectible exchange marketplace that maintains the highest level of ethics and authenticity. Um, and that's very much on brand for what you've been talking about this whole time, giving value, but where, how, how did you see this as a, 
part of the market that was missing where we really need to explicitly talk about the ethics and the authenticity of a, a collectible exchange marketplace? I mean, the good news is that there are a lot of people putting out some really good products and there are some companies that have good authentications. I think sometimes people come out and they're like, well, my authentication is the only one everything else is. That's, that's, that's not my point. I think the reality is I, I know at, at my old company, you know, we put out probably 20, 25 million collectibles into the marketplace and I'm not the only guy in town. So I know there's millions and millions of things and I think people want to trade and they want to be able to buy stuff that's not so uh, commoditized. You know, they want to buy something that's unique or different. So what, I wanted to create a platform and collectible exchange where people can buy and sell this stuff and do it safely. And you go on eBay, there's a lot of good stuff on eBay, but there's just a lot of bad stuff and there's nobody there to guide you. On our site, you have an option if you want to go send it in for an authentication. We have a button also if you want to actually call in and say, well, how much should uh, a, a Peyton Manning signed football cost? Because I see a football on here for $500, $300, and $1,000. It's confusing to me. Oh, oh, it's not on a real NFL football. Oh, it's, that one's not even authenticated. Oh, and so we're offering some of that guidance to people so we can explain the hobby protect people in, in their buying and trading. And, you know, the bottom line is there are a lot of people sitting with all kinds of stuff, especially my generation, we were big savers. And I think the younger generation is interested, but they want more proprietary stuff. I'm trying to help, you know, that bridge that gap in a more safe, organized way. At the same time, we're only in a soft launch now, although we have 40,000 items on there, but we're creating a community, a fandom community where you know, fans are going to be able to talk about their product, how they got it, the story behind the story kind of thing. Because that's as interesting. Like, somebody may buy my Mickey Mantle ball, but they're not going to know. I was with Mickey, and we are having lunch. We had, like, 20 drinks. And, you know, he wrote da-da-da-da-da on there because we were going back and forth. Like, that's a cool story. So somebody bought that. You know, I got that from that marketing guy, Brandon Stein, who was with Mickey back in 1990. You know, I, I want to share those stories because I think, you know, as this baby boomer generation, we huge collectors. Those stories are going to die with us. So I'm hoping to kind of capture the stories along with the product so that uh, the younger generation can take those collectibles and enjoy the stories along with the product. Absolutely. I mean, the stories very are... Very excited about this. You know, we're only four or five months into it, but, you know, we're very excited about also partnering up with the players so that fans can buy directly from the players. So you'll see on our site over the summer, you'll be able to buy something directly from a player and that's the first time that we're going to be, be able to do that. And that's going to be fun, too, so the players can interact. And then they can dictate how much this stuff costs. And then they can direct some of the money to their charities and stuff like that. I think that's fantastic, man. And, I, I, again, I, I, so. I just – we'll see. I'm sure if you're behind it, it's going to be pretty successful. You've done some good things so far in your life. And, again, I just think that's a really great way of going about it because the stories are – you know, that's why that Mickey Mantle ball means so much to you is the story behind it. Right. That's why exactly. the, yeah. the, you know, the Mets poster in my room that's signed by David Wright, it, it just means more to me because there's that story behind it of how I got it, why I got it, when I got it. Exactly. And I think that those are always the very important parts. And I'm a storyteller. I love listening to people tell stories like yourself and it's always much more enjoyable. So maybe one of these days we can sit down, I'll buy you 20 drinks and you know, I'll have you sign a baseball <laughs> after a few and we'll see what happens. Um, I look forward so, to it. <laughs> so you're working, obviously you're working on collectible exchange. Now you're also, you know, you have the Steiner agency as well, which recently started again too. So what exactly are you doing there? That's kind of a little bit more unique in the marketplace on that side. Well, on that particular point, it really not, we're basically doing what I've been doing really since the late 80s, and that is, you know, helping companies grow through the use of sports and celebrities. Uh, we've teamed up with a whole bunch of different clients to help them act, acquire the talent they need. The, diff, the only difference in that company, so that's pretty plain and simple, but, you know, finding the right talent and negotiating the right deal for a client is a little bit of a lost art. And it's definitely changing because the way you deal with a player now has a lot more to do with them showing up more to do with their social media and their followings and those kind of testimonials or short videos. So the marketing approach with these celebrities is changing. The only difference in, in the Steiner agency is that we're doing a lot of cause marketing. So we go to a lot of companies that are trying, you know, if you open up McDonald's in the Bronx, like the people in the Bronx, like you can't just put a couple of garbage cans in the corner and be good. Like that, that was the old, Oh, we're helping the community. No, no, no. Put a couple of garbage cans. No. No, 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 no. You give away some free hamburgers? No. You got to go build a basketball court or fix up a library or so companies are challenged now to do a lot deeper 
good. I think a lot of companies have done good, but they don't, they don't have the full commitment. And what's difficult is it's hard to go into communities and get you know, the politics and, and, and get all the, all the governances that you need to go do the good. So with the show that I did on Yes called The Hookup, which we did all kinds of good for police stations, firehouses, uh, hospitals, parks, all kinds of stuff. I've met so many people that run charities and I've also gotten involved with the people that run the police department, that run the fire department. So I, you know, I know a little bit of how that works. So what, what I love doing is, is a company wants to do some good in the Bronx and I know a player that is dying to do more good in the Bronx. Instead of paying a player a lot of money to go into the Bronx and do some good, we find a player whose initiative is to do more good in the Bronx and instead of having to pay the player a lot of money, we just put a lot more money into doing the good. And we do it behind the player so the player feels like they're getting something done. And then most importantly, the beneficiary is the cause. And the money gets put in the right place. And I'm able to go do, you know, basically be the expediter and the executor to make all that happen. And, and in some cases, put some of my own money into it because, you know, I'm, that's at this point, I'm working. A good part of why I work still is to do more good and to help more people. So... I love using the power and the influence that I have in my small little circle, frankly, of doing these little projects with different companies. Uh, and it's, 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 it's been fun. It's very fulfilling uh, because it's the match that really, that I think a lot more companies need to make instead of, you know, spending all this money just on, you know, just quick little plugs just to get name identification. Do you do more good? It goes a lot longer way. And I think if it's made a little easier for these companies, which is what I'm hoping to do, um, I, I feel like I feel good about it. So that company has been a lot of fun. It's completely different. I've separated the two companies. That company's in a city in Manhattan and, and it has its own separate staff where before when I was at Steiner, we had everybody kind of combined together. I separated now both entities and both staffs. But it's been better play. That makes sense. It makes sense. Um, and I think that's great. And again, that cause marketing effect has been something that while you haven't said it explicitly until just, just a few moments ago, it, it felt like that's kind of the person you've been your whole life is, you know, giving value, always giving back and the karma aspect, you know, you do a lot of good, a lot of good is then going to come back to you and, and helping out these athletes and helping out the communities that you've been able to serve, I think is absolutely fantastic. And clearly you're doing a great job, man. And like, let's, let's keep that okay. rolling. So. Well, I'm also grateful. I think the players get it. I mean, I think, you know, different between the players I work with today versus 30 years ago is I think the players understand, the commitment and the responsibility to do, just do a lot more with all their success that they get. And I think the players are, I mean, I think, you know, you look at most players and you always read about the ones that get in trouble, but I think a majority of the players are doing a lot of really good stuff. And in some cases, amazing stuff. And I'm very proud. I mean, in the nineties, I was really worried. Was, I mean, players were not quite getting it and it wasn't really all clicking. There was a, always a, some exceptions, but now, the players that get in trouble, are, are, they're a little more the exception. I think most players have a lot of causes and a lot of interest in, in giving back and doing some good. And, and that's, that's a big influence on us in our communities when you have you know, really high profile people like that doing good work. And I love the direction the NBA has gone. Uh, I mean, these guys have just become incredible generals to cause and, and some of the work that some of the, some of the players around the league are doing is, is insanely good. Yeah, I, I love it too. And, yeah. you know, hopefully, you know, more and more players can jump on board with you and you can help them out and they can help you out and the communities out. I think that's important. And, and talking about cause marketing, I know, obviously, you know, right now what we're going through with the pandemic, I know that you guys are working on a uh, COVID-19 charity auction. Uh, so if you don't mind telling us a little bit about that, so maybe we can get a couple more people involved in, uh, in what you guys are doing. Yeah, I mean, we, we just went to a bunch of players and a couple of players went to us because they know I always do something around something that's happening. And we just put together an auction with some experiences with Bill Walton, Long Lawrence Taylor, a bunch of guys, and people are bidding on it. You just, you'll just you see right on the homepage on Collectible Exchange or CX stuff. Um, you know, we're also doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, I just raised, uh, I think it was like $20,000, hopefully going to raise a little more with White Plains Hospital with uh, them helping feed a lot of people. And, and I'm doing some work with a food bank. You know, I feel kind of bad because, you know, you're confined. You can't leave the house. I feel like you want to go out there. You know, you want to help, and you can't. But, you know, you can do the little things. And, you know, there's a lot of people that don't have food. There's a lot of people that are having a try hard time even going to pick up food. Um, the hospitals are, are definitely running really low on supplies, you know, sort so of refuel them and, you know, making even a small donation. You know, you, you, you do your part. So I feel like um, – the auction is going to help the overall, you know, relief fund, and hopefully they'll find good usage of, of supplies and, and feeding people. 
And then my local hospital is, is everything. They've done an amazing job at White Plains Hospital and uh, Hillside Food Bank, you know, which feeds the elderly and puts out meals and delivers those meals. I, I thought that was important at this time because I'd hate to see elderly people having to worry about where they're going to get food from. So, you know, my wife and I get behind that as well. So, you know, you try to do your part. It's frustrating because, you know, I, I've, you know, you always go out there and I get some athletes, we group together, we do some media, we go put a fundraiser on and you can't do that. So you got to kind of figure out your own way to just do your little part. And that's, that's my thinking. And Hey man, you're doing a great job at it and we appreciate you. And Brandon, the last question I have for you is, you know, obviously you do so much and you're trying to help so many people and you're doing a great, great job at it. What, what are you doing on a daily basis to continue to not accept what are you doing on a daily basis to continue to push forward and make sure that you're being better every single day? It's a good question. And it does get a little harder, you know, as you get a little older, um, you know, you, you know, you, you, you start thinking about, you know, first of all, one of the things I do is, you know, I, I don't begrudge myself of relaxing, which is, you know, in this past year of, you know, taking some time and watching some TV or just hanging out with my wife and, and I'm okay doing nothing and it, it makes the time when I'm trying to do something a little bit better as opposed to just trying to be busy all the time. I know that sounds a little weird, but, um, but you know, I don't have that much of a problem with it. It's, it's been my DNA. So I, I'm trying to make sure that I get my workout in every day. So I have some clarity and I can see different things and have different visions while I'm working out. I do it more for my mental health of just trying to see things and, and, and try to make up stuff. And you know, I do a lot of pictureization while I'm working out I do a lot of movie, you know, just roll, just play on. Oh, wow, imagine if I did this, imagine if I do that. So I just try to constantly reamp things that I, that are almost impossible to do. Like I always tell people, like, I'm half illiterate. I've not, never been a good writer. I probably don't read anywhere enough of what I should. And, and here I've published over 2,500 blogs and have 150,000 people to read my blog. And it's just funny, like, I don't know. I just, I, I just like trying different things and doing different things. And, I'm in a transition year. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm grinding. I still like working, but I'm definitely looking at some different hobbies. Probably going to start playing a little more tennis and, and probably going to pick up the guitar again. Um, and, you know, I, I, listen, I consider my, one of my big hobbies and what keeps me really hungry is helping people and finding causes that I either can contribute to or I can help with the marketing. So I just pick random charities and I reach out to the leader and I'm like, listen, I'm on your website. It sucks. Uh, you got to change this. You got to do that. And, you know, maybe we could have lunch. Let me go over a little overview. You're not really telling the story right. I just did it last night. I went on this first. I probably killed this lady. She was actually very nice and grateful about it. But, you know, people, you know, they're not, they're, they're doing God's work, man. They're not necessarily the best business people. So I randomly pick out a lot of smaller charities that normally wouldn't be able to get somebody like myself on it. And I come up with a scheme and a theme and I'll stay with them for a month or two and help them through it and show them through it. And then they kind of pick it up on their own. They realize that that works. So I, you know, that's kind of a hobby. And I've done that for a whole bunch of charities. And I love that. And it's like my contribution. Sometimes it's even better than the money is teaching them how to get the money or teaching them how to, you know, communicate what they do. And that's what I've been doing. I mean, you know, I try, I don't want to overcomplicate things. I got great kids and about to get married, some of them. And I want to make sure that I, I'm free spirited to enjoy the beginning of their real true adulthood and I don't want to get myself too clogged down to be honest with you because I have been grinding since I'm 10 so I probably work more than most and even when I'm not even working as hard I'm probably still working more than most but I definitely have learned to kind of tone it down a little bit. Well good for you man you've done a lot of good work in your career uh, you're, I know you're going to continue to do it Brandon this was absolutely fantastic thank you for joining me today man. Thanks for having me man look forward to talking to you again we'll have to grab those 20 beers. 20 beers. You got it, man. On me, I promise.